is uh, humility or khushu and gratitude uh, and shukr. So right now that's where I am. Imam Fawadi Adrami, mashallah, has an ability of um, kind of making principles come to life or words take on like this newfound meaning. Um, where something like shukr, he really like has like a holistic approach to shukr. Something like patience, a holistic approach, like you can live your whole life with patience. Um, he's, he's pretty phenomenal on that, mashallah. I, yeah, I, and uh, he has uh, supporting evidences from the Quran. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it connects, you know, it connects very well. I think it's really, really, really cool like that. Yeah. Uh, so any, any text or book by him, I'm just always just surprised at the ability of um, him, him to the like, paradigm shift um, through like redefine a word. And it's a prophetic quality because that's apparently what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do as oh. well. Um, the Prophet Allah I said, I'm used to redefine words for people, like like think simple words that they thought they already knew, like success, wealth, patience, anger, um, completely changed their perspective on it. So, mashallah, may Allah preserve him. He's a, he's a really good guy. I recommend any any text by him. He also goes into like the four elements in this book, which is really <laughs> cool. Of course he does. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been told by someone that he's watched Avatar before. Allahu um, Alam, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, let's go ahead and get started. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rabbi shahri sadri wa sadri amri, wa ahlil uqtadam milisani ya fuqa wa rabbi zidhi ilma. We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon our final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, welcome back to our daily Ramadan Quran study or major themes in the Quran, a series in which um, just so everyone appreciates and understands the, the purpose, um, we're trying our best to understand the major themes in the Quran, not as a summary, but more as it's kind of like if you're building a home, you understand the pillars that the home is built on so that if you see every round, all the random that the home uh, are belong to the home that you're like wait i know the pillar I know the general section of the house they go into so that's how we're going to be phrasing it and there's eight major themes that we're starting on and today we're starting on the major theme of the quran which is uh, going to be of course the theme of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is allah um is is a major theme and i tried my best to uh not choose an ayah that everyone was familiar with, but I couldn't. Literally, uh, just so you guys understand my process, as I'm reading the Quran with all of you and going through our projects that all of us have in Ramadan to reconnect ourselves with the Quran, I literally will look at an ayah and be like, which ayah seems to have affected me and seems to capture some sort of truth um, that is just amazing and uh, captures one of the uh, major themes of the Quran. And the ayah, can anyone guess what ayah stuck out? And the theme of today is going to be God, or who is God, or finding God. Ayatul Kursi? Yep. <laughs> so today's ayah is Ayatul Kursi. Um, it's got a lot of merits associated with it, and uh, I want to literally like go through it and see what we can uh, take from it and what we literally learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this one ayah. But uh, I, I could not choose Ayatul Kursi. One, because... Today's day two of Ramadan. I'm right around just two and a half uh, to three. So I'm right around finishing uh, Ayat al-Kursi. And I just finished Baqarah and I'm on an Imran. Um, but when you're talking about an ayah that really encapsulates who is Allah with such profound, uh, such profundity, Ayat al-Kursi just sticks out. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully the share screen works today. Could you please review uh, the eight uh, themes we're going through this series? I'll be even more impressed if you guys tell me what the eight themes were for those that were here yesterday. Mm. Anyone remember them? Does it count if I have them written down? It still counts. It's, it's, <laughs> that's, there's a way to trap knowledge, right? Any, any way to trap knowledge works. Okay, so one is um, talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his signs. Two is uh, revelation in the in prophethood. Three is humans as individuals, as in what drives us and what motivates us. Mm-hmm. Four is human beings as a society. 
five is nature in and of itself and um, like the signs that we see in nature from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Six is the nature of the akhirah. Seven is evil and what keeps us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And eight is what does it mean to be submitted to Allah? Yep. Um, the eighth one, if I was to put uh, organize it in another way, it would be um, the Muslim system or the Muslim society would be what the eighth one is. Uh, I'll, I'll, could also be titled as. Um, nice job, Isra. Really appreciate that uh, uh, you put that together. And um, the way that I'm going to be going about this is we're going to take three or four days on each of the um, uh, major themes. So eight doesn't divide well into 30. <laughs> so that's why it's going to be three or four. Um, and we'll, we'll make it work, inshallah, uh, however we can. Um, so with that said, I'm going to jump into today's theme is going to be on understanding who is Allah. Um, because a major theme of the Quran, of course, is um, understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and the best way to do that is honestly how Allah describes Allah's self. And when you look at any page of the Quran, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned uh, close to 12 times. It's usually almost once per line that you'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. Um, so, like, of course, Allah is the major subject of, uh, of the Quran. And if there was one way to sum up the Quran in its entirety, it would be recognize Allah and submit to Allah. Or recognize Allah and behave as if you recognize Allah. Those would be like the major summary of the Quran or recognize that Allah is all powerful and you are in need of Allah. Those would be summaries of, of it. But I thought Kursi really hits that in a very uh, um, interesting fashion. I just wanted to go over some ways to appreciate that inshallah in, in today's uh, brief session. My intention is to finish by six o'clock, possibly even earlier than six o'clock. Um, so I'll start off with just reciting uh, Ayat al-Kursi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum La ta'akhuduhu sinatan wa la nawm Lahu ma fi s-samawati wa ma fi l-ard Man dha al-ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-idhni Ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم and it's broadly translated um, as usual, I have my three or four translations. I'm going to use the Abdul Halim translation for this one. God, there is no God but him. The ever living, the ever watchful, neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him. All that is in the heavens and in the earth belongs to him. Who is there that can intercede with him except by his leave? He knows what is before them and what is behind them, but they don't comprehend any of his knowledge except what he wills. His throne extends over the heavens and the earth, it's not, and it does not weary him to preserve them both. He is the most high, the tremendous. Sounds relatively basic, but what I wanted really to build today is why is this one ayah considered such a significant um, uh, description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that says that this is Sayyid al Ayat. This is the best ayah in the entire Quran. And in another narration, Sayyid al Quran, the best of the Quran is actually Ayat al Kursi. Why? Because it describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to actually make the claim today that it's because Ayat al Kursi actually encapsulates the essence of how we're supposed to behave with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we're supposed to view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I, the way I'm going to go through it is at, there are nine major sections within Ayat al Kursi. I'm going to give you almost like a, um, a quick run through it, through each, each section. And if anyone wants to comment or talk about how that relates to them, or some, even ask a question, if it doesn't make any sense, um, feel free to do that. because again, 
it's meant to be interactive, though when we get into longer ayats, it becomes hard to do that because each ayah is a coherent message by itself. So oftentimes it becomes weird, but just feel free to chime in, inshallah, um, and we'll we'll create this as a conversation. So how does this discourse about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin? Uh, the one thing we have to appreciate is this is not the first ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. Like Allah doesn't start about start by talking about an introduction to who Allah is. This is a conversation that takes place after five stories in the Quran. You have the story of Adam alayhi salam. You have the story of Bani Israel post Fir'aun. You have the story of uh, uh, that story is, can be divided up into three basic stories, but I'm going to keep it as one of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. You have the story of Dawud alayhi salam. And then you get this. So it's it's this interesting um, approach of like after all of these ayat, you would assume that if you're talking about God's been a major character, why would the introduction to God be so far in? I'll, the the answer to that is going to be as we unpack each of the uh, um, uh, subsections of this uh, ayah, you'll really get to appreciate why is it that it's found so late into the into the surah itself. And the two major themes I want you to think about is uh, Allah starts off with Allahu la ilaha and Allah ends with wa huwa al-aliyul azim. And the thing I want you to think about is Allah starts with being ilaha, the object of all your love and all your closeness and ends off with wa huwa al-aliyul azim. And Allah is so far beyond you, you can't even comprehend. Just keep that in mind, just sowing seeds for later in this conversation for them to hopefully fruit. Um, but Allah starts off the ayah, Allahu la ilaha. Um, who is Allah? Allah is, uh, uh, there is no ilah. We immediately start getting into the conversation. Some of you have heard me go through the ilah versus, um, rather than using the term God, I don't like the term God for ilah. Um, because ilah is actually a word in Arabic that means the object of your love. And in Arabic, there's a ton of words for love. Um, I'll, I'm going to quickly actually go through all 14 of them with you. Um, uh, there's 14 words for love in the Arabic language. Hawa, sabwa, sharaf, najwa, um, al-wud, al-khulla, al-gharam, al-wala, al-hiyam, Al-wajd, al-kallaf, al-shawa, al-stikana. These are the words for love in Arabic. And they don't all mean the same thing. These are actually considered many times the many different levels of love. I am not going to go over every single level of love right now. But the first level is typically hawa. Hawa is seen as like lustful love. It's like a, we'd call it almost like a crush. Like it's an infatuation. That's hawa. Then there's loves that's a little bit further than that will be like al-wajd. Al-wajd is like, you know when you really miss someone? Like, the, you, you used to spend time with them, but now you don't. But And you, something reminded you of them, and like, ah, you get that warm feeling inside. That's wajd. Um, the ja in it is something, it's on the inside, but it shows in your face. That's wajd. Um, uh, had, najwa. Najwa is a love that you're kind of embarrassed by. It's a love that you you love something so much that you don't want to show other people, but it shows anyway. So it causes you to blush. I want you to also appreciate for a second, like such a beautiful, nuanced way of expressing love. So anyway, I just think that's kind of cool. Um, that's that's uh, Najwa. Like it's a secret and you can't hide that secret. So like that's Najwa. Um, istikana is an interesting form of love. It's a paralyzing form of love. It's a love that you love someone so much that it paralyzes you because you're not sure how the, your lover is going to interact with you or how they're going to react to what you do. So you actually freeze and you can't really move. That's istikana. And then the 13th form of love is alwala. Alwala is a, someone you love so much that it takes all of your pain away. Someone who you love so much, it almost seems like they were designed for you. Another way that they used to call the wala is um, they used to give the example of a stick that when you hold it, it holds you back. Um, sticks don't hold you back. But the idea of it's like ergonomic. It feels like your hand was designed for my hand to be in it. <laughs> right? Like that's the idea of like wala. It feels like this love was just there. You feel complete when you are in this relationship. That's wala. 
And then there's one actually above wala, and that's al-hiyam. Al-hiyam is a type of love that kills you. It's actually the neg a negative form of love. Um, it, there used to be a disease that the camels used to get, um, uh, and they'd call it al-himya. And that was that a camel that has been dehydrated for long enough um, would literally drown itself in water. Um, it just probably had rabies. So that's probably what it was actually going on. Um, but it would see water and it, it would literally drown itself. And the Arabs said that this was himya. Himya is a type of love that's so bad that you destroy yourself. What we understand as ilah, like what is God at the end of the day for us is an ilah, is the one we love so much that it takes away our pain. The one we love so much that it feels like we were created to be in this relationship. That's ilah. Allahu la ilaha. Allah is the one that there is no ilah other than. Allah is the only ilah. Sometimes we talk about, um, uh, in other traditions, God means love. How come Muslims don't think God means love? It does. The word Allah is al-ilah. That's one of the ways of understanding Allah. There's another academic debate that Allah is just a more proper name for God. But still, but there's this idea of like ilah is found with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And specifically in Ayat al-Kursi, la ilaha illa huwa. Allah is who? La ilaha illa huwa. You're never going to get a love. There's no one who can fulfill that ilah, that hole in your heart, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That relationship in which you will feel fulfilled, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no other ilaha um, uh, that's there. Um, so that's that's how Allah Subhanahu wa actually starts this. And the first statement, um, I, it's, uh, if someone took notes on the uh, different forms of love that I just mentioned, you go ahead and post them. If not, then I'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll write a post at the end, inshallah, um, with all of them in the group chat. Um, and Isra always coming through with the notes, mashallah. Nice job. Um, so. Well done, well done. You are you are quick. Um, <laughs> um, where was I with this? So a lot. This this uh, ayah is going to be again a series of nine statements, and I want you to pay attention to that number of nine because nine is an odd number, and uh, we'll get into that in, a, in at, at the end of this, inshallah. But uh, the first statement of this surah is or of this ayah is Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. Allah, there is no ilah. No object of your love, no person who deserves your love, no entity that can capture your love and give you fulfillment like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And two titles of Allah are mentioned straight off the bat. Al-Hayy wal-Qayyum. Al-Hayy wal-Qayyum. Al-Hayy is typically translated as the ever-living. And Al-Qayyum is typically the sustainer. Both of these words are also really, really cool because what Allah actually does is take every, with every statement that's being made, it's going to take away a false conception of how people used to think of God. And to me, like, as I was going through this today, it just like hit me that, man, the solution to so many problems is just to appreciate Allah for who Allah is. Um, Allah is living. And you love something that's not living. The answer to that question is usually yes, but is it, can it love you back? And the answer to that is no. I can love chocolate, but chocolate doesn't love me. That's not how it works. The idea of Allah starts off with this close relationship. Allah is your ilah, the object of your love. So approachable, your personal relationship that's going to make you feel fulfilled. One of the requirements for that to happen is that the one who exists, the one who's alive, Muslims don't believe in a dead God. And I know that sounds weird to say, but just keep in mind what it means when someone is alive. When some, when, or something is alive, that means it reacts. That means it's active. It's actually part of a process. Rather than, you know how there's some conceptions of people go like, God is just a ball of energy. God is the universe, right? They'll, they'll just say stuff like that. No, that's actually not the conception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have. Allah is living. Allah is the source of all life. And if anything, Allah is the only one who actually has full life because the rest of life that's there are all 
from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they used to not exist and then they exist. Allah is the only one that always is living, always has been living, always will be living. So Allah is actually al hayy That's a huge part of the definition of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. The living, this beloved entity that is living and reacts. Um, so that's al hayyu and al qayyum um, Oh, and the other thing I have to say is just, just so we appreciate al hayyu for a little bit. Um, sometimes there's even like mythologies made of like uh, there might be an energy that binds the universe together that you can manipulate and make things happen. Like the force, like in Star Wars. Yeah, that's not Allah. Allah is living. Like our conception of Allah, Allah is not to be manipulated and used. Allah is living. You care about Allah. Allah cares about you. There's a living, breathing relationship. Al-Qayyum, the maintainer. The first part of the surah is going, the first part of this ayah, I keep saying surah because it, it basically has the income, the message of um, uh, that, that's found within the entire discourse. But Al-Qayyum, the maintainer. It comes from Qa'im to stand. It comes from this idea of uh, uh, Qawam. Qawam is someone who supports or maintains something. Al-Qa'im is the one who's standing or maintains something. Like when you maintain your posture, it's that. But it's to the nth level. It's to the hyperbolic level of Qayyum. It's actually not something that's used in normal uh, Arabic at all. But it's the one who sustains everything, takes care of everything. Your smallest needs to the biggest needs, th th this is the one who's who's doing it. Um, the It could a blade of grass that is bent to your heartbeat to the sun exploding. All of them are being put together by what? By al hay al qayyum This idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just one who created things because you could say, okay, if Allah is the origin of all life and Allah is living, but does that mean that Allah cares about the creation? No, Allah is also qayyum. Allah is maintaining the creation because that's again getting, uh, demystifying another myth of how people perceive God. God might have created us. There might even be a living God, but God doesn't care about us. You and I aren't important. No, no, no. Al Qayyum. Allah didn't just, like, you know, like the typical clock wake, oh, maker analogy that God made a clock, which was the universe, and it's just running its course. No, Allah is Al Qayyum. From the smallest need to the biggest need of the universe, Allah is constantly the one who is um, uh, supporting it, making sure that it still exists. Um, never sitting idle. And why is Qayyum used? They're standing. Because when you're really, really trying uh, uh, to stand, uh, uh, maintain something, give it your full attention, you stand, you don't sit down. We're going to have a conversation about a throne or a kursi soon, but Allah doesn't sit down. Al Qayyum, the one who's always standing, because that's how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares. Yes, we don't use the physical term standing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's the idea of standing, the attention that's found within it. Um, and the other thing I have to say is that almost every description that's going to be found here isn't because it's applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's because Allah, through Allah's mercy, wants to relate to us. So Allah will use examples that we can relate to. So Allah is al-hayyu, alive, here for you, ilah, the object of your love, and qayyum, constantly maintaining everything that you do and is constantly looking um, uh, and, and watching things. But I'm going to have to say, and it doesn't, there's, uh, how else am I going to say this? This makes sense that this would be the first statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to describe Allah's self, because it's almost getting into, uh, what's the point of worship? If you worship a God that doesn't care about you, if you worship a God that's not living, what's the point of worshiping? Actually, that's not Allah. Allah is the one who cares about you, who loves you, and is constantly maintaining you. That's why there's a point in worship. There's a point in keeping this relationship going. I'm going to pause here for a second. Any questions or comments? I have a question about, you said um, in terms of life and death and the reciprocation of love. Um, so what about the actual dead? Like someone who has a parent or a sibling or a friend that has died they the person who's alive can love them but that we have the concept of like our soul being in the grave so is that person that's in the grave also able to love back so 
semantics are what's being discussed here because yeah. even when someone dies are they really truly dead the answer to that question is no no yeah okay that's what i thought but i just wanted to check yeah no it's, it's a good question but this is where we separate between a bodily death um and the idea that their soul lives on so they didn't actually fully die okay so that's why that relationship can continue and should continue like our tradition actually promotes us to do that uh, that your loved ones, you still make dua for them. Your loved ones, you still think about them because the relationship didn't end. Right. And then the whole concept of like you being reunited in Jannah. So you're in the same realm, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. Yep. Anyone else? I wonder what the... um. So can you explain, so before I say my comment, can you explain, um, so you, we were talking about uh, Al-Qayyum being this, like the one who stands. Mm -hmm. um, what, so I guess what, what sort of significance does that have? As in, do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, so it's, it's done in, it's, it's done for two things. So Qayyum will be the epitome of uh, uh, taking care of something. Um, so okay. it, it brings up two images here. One is it could be the one who allows everything to stand, right? Because when something's maintained, it's upright. It, it's not been allowed to fall over. Or it's you're so vigilant in it that you never get to sit down. I see. Does that make sense? That's yeah. why like Al-Qa'im is typically actually the maintainer. It's someone who's so busy that they never, they're, they're always standing because they're always watching stuff. Mm. We would never say that about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we don't anthropomorphize Allah. Yeah. So it, metaphorically, we say Allah is always involved and Allah is always caring. And that's where the sustainer element comes in, that making everyone else stand. I, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, my comment is, um, I think it's interesting that um, now, that, now, that, now that you've explained that, um, you know, in Surah Al-Muzamil and Surah al there, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet to stand. And, um, and you know, and, and then all these Kind of different connotations than you know apply to the prophet too. The idea of Qumil Layla, it's actually true. I know we normally say it, it's like stand up. It could also be support. Mm. Support, support each other, make each other stand at night. Mm. Isn't that kind of beautiful? That is. <laughs> um, so it's almost like take care of each other at night because in the day you're being abused. So yeah, there's something so beautiful about that once you appreciate, like this is Qayyum. It's coming from a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm, that's really cool. I'm going to continue on now. Let, and now we're in statement two. Remember, there's going to be nine statements. Statement two. La ta'khuduhu sinata wa la I'm going to translate it badly first. Um, neither overtakes him sleep, uh, slumber or sleep. Um, yes, I spoke English in the, in the wrong way, but I mean more authentic to the uh, Arabic. Um, two things. That uh, uh, um, is something that takes over someone, like to be to take on a quality. It's that khudu. Um, and the two qualities are sinata. Uh, sinata is quite literally, like this is the best way I can describe it is um, you're, you were trying to pay attention and then like, like, Something just happened where your attention was lost for a second. Um, either it couldn't keep your attention or you didn't have the physical capability of giving it your attention, right? Um, that's some of you right now in this lecture. <laughs> I made every intention to listen, but like, Kaiser, you're just too boring. So like Sinato starts taking it, right? So that, that could be happening, but it's like this idea of drowsiness. And I want you to think about the imagery that's produced here. Um, I'm going to actually share a story here <laughs> because it's fun to sometimes share stories. Um, when my wife was going through labor, um, one of the things I had committed to is she's going through labor. I'm going to be literally standing by her side the entire time because I want to be helpful and I want to be watchful. And I want to take care of her every need. Um, I did that for like 10 hours, 12 hours. And then I was, and then she got a picture of me napping in the, on the couch thing. Uh, because what happened at first drowsiness like I was like I could barely keep myself awake because couldn't keep myself awake I was tired too and then eventually she's like just just go sit, sit down for a little bit I'm fine and she looks over a couple of minutes later I am knocked out completely because what is it like I I'm not capable of 
sustaining. I wanted to be qawam in that case. I wanted to be a supporter of her, but I'm not capable. <laughs> uh, Allah is al qayyum. I'm not. I'm the lowest level of the qa'im <laughs> element, right? So I tried, but what happened? Drowsiness first overtook me, and then wanom, eventually sleep. <laughs> I lost complete attention at that point. Um, and why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use these attributes? Again, these are attributes that don't apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. But why is Allah using these to talk about it? Because Allah is making Allah's uh, self relatable to us. This ayah, this surah started off, or this ayah again, I keep saying surah. This ayah started off with Allah saying, Allah is the most beloved personal person to you. Per personal kind of entity to you. But then as we keep going on this ayah, Allah will be talking about how Allah is actually not like you. And there's actually something beautiful that's created there because that's actually the Muslim's relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is so close to you. Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein. Like the thing that's keeping you alive. Allah is there with you all the time, but Allah is not like you. There is a difference. There is distance that's created. And that's actually the approach that we have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're supposed to be so close, but you're supposed to be respectful. Because you know what happens when someone is so close, so close, so close? You actually lose respect for them. I've made this mistake before. Um, in a former life, I used to teach um, uh, younger kids, like sixth graders. And one of the mindsets that I had is, I'm going to be like their best friend. So like first day, second day, third day, I'm just like entertaining them the entire time. To the point where like they, like literally, like I, they treat me like I'm one of their own. And then I'm like, on the fourth day, I'll finally open a book. Like once the relationship has built, been built, right? And then I, I try to open the book. And they're like, no, boo, tell us another joke. Tell us another story. And I'm like, but we, we have to go through the lesson plan. No, because what happened? Like, who, if you go too far into that role, actually, people stop behaving properly what you intended for them like you were like i was on a very low level in charge of their therapia their development i was supposed to teach them something i was supposed to be their teacher but because i completely took away any idea of me having authority they no longer took me seriously so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah is super close to you allah is there for you and allah is super relatable to you but allah is also not like us there's a degree of respect that we're supposed to maintain. It never gets to the point where we're taking Allah for granted in Audhu Billah. There's always going to be, that's why there's a push-pull relationship um, between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's actually best for us. Um, so that's why teachers are supposed to actually do that fine line. You can joke around sometimes, you can get really close. But when time comes, if you want your students to succeed, you need to establish some level of authority or else the relationship falls apart. Um, so something kind of beautiful here, that's why Allah will talk about qualities that aren't like us, just like what Allah will talk about qualities that are like us. Um, Allah continues then. Uh, um, so uh, all of these crazy things of like holding up the entire universe, uh, making sure that every aspect of your life is exactly the way it needs to be, every heartbeat that Allah knows it and put big in charge and a sustainer of everything that doesn't have any negative aspect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Allah doesn't get tired and uh, uh, Allah doesn't fall asleep. Something interesting is Allah actually uses the, uh, for those of you who are slight Arabic nerds like me, is what's found here. Those are the, in, uh, the indefinite forms of it because uh, even though al hay was the life, and the sustainer, but here is slumber and sleep, not even any aspect of slumber, not a big aspect of slumber or a big or a small aspect of slumber, no idea of slumber and no idea of sleep is applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we're going to start seeing, seeing some separations between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And eventually this is all going to build up. We're only on statement two. We're going to get to statement nine. That's all going to build up to statement nine, which is, the most high, the most great. And that's going to be contrasted, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, with Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. Allah is so close to you here, taking care of your every need, responsible for your life and your love, but also 
Ali al Azim, the grand one who the entire universe is really based off of um, or reliant on. Um, I see a, uh, um, something in the chat. Sadman said, in the Bible, I think that in the Torah, it says that God rested on the seventh day. Uh, the Quran does not say that Allah rested on the seventh day. If anything, it says like they say that God rested. God doesn't need any rest. Um, so it actually uh, um, kind of says that that's, a, that's, that's an improper thing that was added into the Bible um, because Allah doesn't need any rest. Um, and this would be a direct kind of contradiction to that from the biblical narrative. Um, any questions now on section two of the surah? Then Allah continues. Um, to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and in the earth. I'm going to put a couple of things in here. Um, one is, uh, there seems to be a weakness in this. Because Allah SWT says what is in the heavens and in the earth. Allah doesn't say that Allah owns the heavens and the earth. <gasps> I'm just going to say the that's coming later on. Wasiya kursi right here. Wasiya kursi kursi us samawati wal ard. So that's already taken care of. So a little bit of a preview. That's going to be taken care of. So that that doesn't uh, make a difference. Um, but the uh, idea of what is in the heavens and what is in the earth, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala owns all of it. Um, most of the time, when we talk about grand structures, we don't talk about people owning it. And what I mean by that is like, does who owns a country? Like we have abstract ideas of like who owns a country. And even if someone was owning something, something like grand, like an airplane, do they own everything that's inside the airplane? If someone owns a ship, do they own all the passengers? No, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lahu ma fis samawati wal ard, owns everything that is in the heavens and in the earth. The first two statements were to get us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third, fourth, fifth, and we're going to get farther and farther away. It'll be this idea of Allah is the one who owns everything that's in it. So, and what are all of you? At the end of the day, you are, um, you are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it makes you appreciate even more so how Allah is so close to you. And also makes you appreciate like how Allah will take care of you like no one else will. Because some of you have probably interacted with like, there's a gardener who, who's like uh, paid to mow the lawn or like paid to like do, do someone's garden and they take care of it. But then there's a way that the owner who loves their garden and they, when they do their lawn, when they uh, prune the plants, they have a special degree of love that's associated with it, right? Allah is your sustainer. But when you're your sustainer of something, are you necessarily the owner? No, in, in our, most of us, the things we sustain, we don't actually own. Even when we think of like our own bodies and everything, we don't own them. Uh, or you think about your, a lot of us are renting homes or something like that. You don't own it. You're just in charge of it for now. Now, Allah is in charge of it and Allah owns it. It's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to me, why is it samawati wa ma fil ard? Uh, because there's this idea of sometimes we, uh, I think in current day, people are like, the universe, the universe is so vast, earth is nothing. Allah's like, no, Allah, Allah has everything in the universe too, but Allah also values all of you on earth. You guys are not a random part of creation. You're important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why samawati wal ard is always contrasted, because we are living in a time in which there's such an emphasis on the skies and the heavens that you're a speck of dust that doesn't matter. No, you matter to Allah. It's actually to break through, break away from that style of thinking. It's try to see that her hands up. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, exactly to that point you just made is that that's another differentiating factor between us humans and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that when you find someone that owns an island or a country or whatever it is that they own, such vast property that they have, you don't generally find that they care about every single human being that works under their rule. It's kind of impossible, actually, if you're the leader of a country to care about every single human being that lives within your country. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he owns everything and anything. And he still cares about each and every one of us individually to the point where he knows exactly where the cells in our body are. 
Yeah. Yeah. And is maintaining them to that degree because they are his at the end of the day. So really kind of beautiful um, of, 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 of this in terms of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would care so much. Why is Allah such a good qayyum? Also because Allah is the owner of all of it. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Um, so much more can be said here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it here for now, um, and move on to the next ayah. Man dhaladi yashfa'u indahu illa bi idnihi. This is now statement number four. Who is there who would intercede or provide intercession except by Allah's will? Allah is the owner of everything. Who is there that's going to have any right to speak? Any right to like come in between two people? I, I think intercession is a, is a topic that a lot of us don't inter, uh, act with all that often because it's not used in common day speech anymore. Intercession would be the idea of kind of coming in between two people. Um, the example I can give is, uh, let's just say I recommended uh, one of you for a job. Um, which like at times I have to write, write recommendations for someone. And what I'm doing at that moment is actually I'm interceding on their behalf because a potential employer or potential like uh, school is trusting in my uh, judgment on a matter because I might have more information than they do on whether so-and-so is appropriate for their program, for this award, for this job. Um, so that's the idea of like you ask for an intercession, yes, Pharaoh. Um, and Allah SWT was putting forward, who is there that's gonna have intercession other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So far, everything we've heard has been when is intercession required is gonna be on the day of judgment, of course. Everything we've had in uh, one, two, section one, two, and three were about this life, how we experience Allah in this life. Now there's a, almost a shift of it's going to be talking about Allah SWT in the, uh, in the afterlife. Who is going to intercede on behalf uh, of anyone in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No one. Right? And uh, who's going to be a shield for anyone? No one has the ability to. Though, um, I'm going to have to call this for what it is. Uh, this is also a shot at dismantling other theologies. Because what is the essence of shirk? The essence of shirk was uh, many religions believe, no, there's a main God, but there's all of these other gods that are they are going to stick up for us, right? They're going to come in and they're going to be like, uh, I worship this God, so this God's going to like speak on my behalf. Um, there's an argument that this is also what uh, the Quran will argue has happened with um, those that believed in the, the followings of Isa, salam, of Jesus, that... Uh, Allah will say in another place in the Quran and ask Isa Islam, did you ever say that you would intercede on, on, uh, on their behalf? And Isa Islam will say, no, I did not. But it's this approach of like, there's God, but my person's different. Like there's God, but I have a different person who I'm going to go through. Who is there that's going to intercede? Allah is the one who created you, gave you life, is the ob- like the one who loves the one who maintains you, all of these things are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing. And there's, there's going to be intercession that's found with, uh, uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's kind of the approach here of um, uh, the uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, wrong ayah. Um, uh, who's going to intercede on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's going to be no middleman. And oftentimes when there's a middleman, there's corruption. Think about any corrupt country on earth. Um, I'm not going to name a few. I, I, Sherpa, I'm about to get into the prophets as I'm interceding for us. Um, but think about any like corrupt country on earth. Um, what's usually the cor- source of the corruption? The law of the land might be good, but you know the person who's going to ex- who's gonna be the executioner of that law will be like the governor. As long as you are okay by the governor, you don't have to follow the law. Like the law says, I'm supposed to pay this much, but if I just pay the governor a bribe, he's the one who was supposed to do it. I'm totally fine. I'm let scot free. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is interjecting who would intercede? If Allah is the one taking care of your every need, Allah is the one who created you, there is no middleman that's found within this. Now, Shurban, your question is very, very valid. 
what about the uh, hadith about the Prophet وسلم, interceding on behalf of the uh, of, of the believers? Well, that, this is where illa bi idnihi, um, except with the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And I want us to really appreciate this. Um, I'm uh, I'm gonna break my uh, goal of trying to finish by six. Do we mind if we finish by six ten or six fifteen? I don't mind at all. Okay. I'm just realizing I'm not even halfway done. <laughs> I'm going to rush through a little bit, but I want to finish Ayat al-Kursi today. Um, it would make very little sense for me to break this off into two days. Um, but uh, except by the uh, shifa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them shifa. And there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that says uh, that on the day of judgment, people will be waiting for the day of judgment to start. And all of humanity will be raised up. And this is a pretty chaotic scene. Think of all of humanity is raised up. And they will be looking for someone to intercede on their behalf. And they will all find Adam alayhi salam, the first human being, the first human civilization. They'll go to Adam and they'll say, you are the first created humans by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must be so beloved to Allah, intercede on our behalf. Like, start the day of judgment. Intercede on our behalf because we can't take this anymore. And Adam alayhi salam will say, nafsi, nafsi. Myself, myself, I disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I ate from the only tree that Allah told me not to eat from. I have myself to worry about. And there's an anger, there's the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has never been this great. I'm afraid for myself. Go talk to Nuh. Then they'll go to Nuh alayhi salam. And they'll go to Nuh alayhi salam and they'll say, uh, you're the uh, uh, such an amazing prophet. You used to call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your entire life, and you were so patient with your people. Intercede on our behalf. Nuh alayhi salam will say, I made dua against my people. I'm afraid for myself, nafsi, nafsi. I want to just pause for a second here and make a side point. Um, we shouldn't make bad duas for, about people. Like, I think Muslims have this, like, unfortunate tendencies of, like, making dua. Duas are always supposed to be for your guidance, for people's guidance, uh, for you to have strength to go through something. Uh, duas are never supposed to be negative, um, like asking something to happen, something bad to happen to someone. Like, that shouldn't be a dua that's had. And that's a lesson that a lot of us are supposed to have, even like tarawiyah. Even if there are, quote, unquote, enemies or people who are doing terrible things to you, you make dua for Allah to guide them or Allah give you the means of withstanding or Allah take away their in, the injustice that's, that's found within it. You don't make dua for destruction. Uh, but Nuh alayhi salam says, I'm afraid I made this dua. And he, Nuh alayhi salam has been told multiple times in the Quran, it's recognized, he had the worst of civilization to deal with. Mm. No civilization was as bad as the civilization of Nuh alayhi salam. So that's that's also put forward. Um, uh, but uh, Nuh alayhi salam will say, nafsi, nafsi, go to Ibrahim. Then people will flock towards Ibrahim alayhi salam. And I can imagine they're not just all sitting next to each other. They have to literally find, like, are you Ibrahim? Are you Ibrahim? Like they have to find words Ibrahim alayhi salam. Um, and they go to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham. And they say, you're the one who made a covenant with Allah. You're the one who, the father of the prophets, of so many prophets that came after you. Uh, intercede on our behalf. And Ibrahim alayhi salam will say, I lied three times in my life. Is in the story of Ibrahim, for justifiable reasons, but he lied three times in his life. I'm afraid of for myself, nafsi, nafsi. And then again, it will be, to, he'll say, go to one of my descendants, Musa. And they'll go to Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam uh, says, nafsi, nafsi. Once again, he's like, I, I accidentally killed someone. I'm worrying about myself. They go to Isa alayhi salam. He says, go to Isa. Isa alayhi salam again says nafsi, nafsi. And he says, um, he doesn't say he did anything that's wrong. He's like, after I left, people started associating me with Allah. Nafsi, nafsi. And then Isa will say, go to Muhammad. And they'll go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And this is the narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam says, uh, at that moment, I will be taught a praise that I have that no one else has ever made before. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam will be in sujood. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam will in that moment um, be in sujood for so long and praise Allah SWT in a new way and be raised to what's known as ma uh, maqam al mahmud uh, like a new station for uh, that no one has gotten before and he will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a unique way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him ya, uh, ya Muhammad what do you want? Ya Muhammad what is it that you're requesting? And the Prophet will say Ummati Ummati 
ummati, 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 ummati. My umma, my umma, my umma, my umma, my umma, my umma. Instead of saying nafsi, myself, myself, he says my umma. And in that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, go and find anyone who has a speck, a mustard seed, like a tiny like speck of iman in their heart. And they will go, they, they will go to uh, Jannah without any hisab. And the Prophet ﷺ will do so. And then the Prophet ﷺ falls right back into sujood and goes, Ummati, Ummati. And Allah SWT says, okay, go and a mustard seed of a mustard seed, like a speck of a speck. Find them, any belief in their heart, enter them into Jannah. Um, it's, it's a good question, Shurban. I don't know the answer to that. Generally, it's understood that it's from the Ummah of Muhammad wasallam, but Allahu Alam. Um, and then uh, once again, this happens the third time speck of a speck of a speck and actually one narration says that it's actually a scrape of a speck of iman like even the hint of it take them and they will go without any hisab that's why we we make dua for the intercession of the prophet but that's only because allah grants him intercession in that day um the this narration is uh, put together by uh, uh anas ibn malik who, who, who was the one who narrated this to a bunch of companions the companions heard this and they're like wait 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 really this many people are going to enter into Jannah? And they're like, hmm, you might have heard something wrong. So they go to Hassan radhi ta'ala anhu, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And they ask Hassan radhi ta'ala anhu, is what it, Anas ibn Malik said true? Are, is Allah going to be that merciful on the day of judgment? And then Hassan goes, what did he tell you? And they narrate what, uh, what Anas ibn Malik told, him, Hassan, told him. And Hassan radhi ta'ala anhu goes, uh, he got most of it, except there's three more times that the Prophet ﷺ will be going through this. Like it'll be even more people, even more people, even more people. And then they're like, what? But then this is where this comes in. We have to all balance this with, this is the hadith about the Prophet ﷺ on the day of judgment. There's an ayah of the Prophet ﷺ on the day of judgment too. There's an ayah in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Prophet ﷺ will, be, will bear witness, do his shifa'a to say, that the people have made left made this Quran mahjura, that they've left this Quran. The intercession is not only in a positive way; it can be in a negative way. So we have to take that with like as a balance. That we're relying, yes, on the intercession of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're relying on the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but it it has a responsibility associated with it. We can't be people who are mahjura to the Quran, like have completely abandoned the Quran, didn't care about the Quran the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expect intercession. Only when we take it seriously do, does intercession become, uh, become a concept. And uh, uh, there's, I believe it's Hassan Adi Ta'ala and who he said that this narration, it shouldn't give people, uh, it should give people hope that they will get the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it shouldn't make them lazy because it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who Allah chooses and who Allah doesn't. But it's only if you value the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to be uh, ready for, to get that intercession. Um, so anyway, that's, I went on kind of a tangent, but I think it's an important tangent. Illa um, bi'idhnihi. And it'll, it's actually setting up uh, for us when we talk about the importance of prophethood. Um, why in our tradition, tawheed and prophethood are linked to each other. That there's oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you have to understand it that Allah also cares enough about us in order to send prophethood, um, in order to send guides for humanity, because that's part of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But anyway, illa bi idnihi, that's the idea of where the intercession comes in. And if we're following logically, again, Allah, the one you love, the one who gave you life, the one who maintains you, the one who never gets tired or sleepy by taking care of you, the one who owns whatever's in the heavens and the earth. Who is going to be there that can intercede on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then Allah continues, uh, uh, section number five now. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ He knows, and another thing I forgot to say in the beginning, um, the subject is found only once in this ayah, in this uh, entire ayah, Allah. But the way you look at each of the nine statements is Allah, la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. Allah, la ta'khudhu sinata wa la naum. Allah, lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Allah, man dhal ladhi yashfa'u in the hu. Do you get what I'm saying? Like Allah found in the beginning is actually going to be the subject of every single um, uh, statement or abhi khabar that comes afterward. So 
more of a grammatical point. I'm always like um, rewarding you grammar nerds. Um, so, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Allah knows what is in front of you, in front of your hands, وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ and the things that are behind you. If someone needed to do shifa'a, right? If someone needed to intercede on your behalf, it's usually because they have more knowledge. But Allah is saying, no, Allah knows what happen, is going to happen in the future. Something you don't even know. Um, and Allah knows what is happening in what happens in the past. Something you never want other people to know. Because I'm going to call this for what it is. You and I have anxiety about the future. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, because the future hasn't yet happened in our, for our frame of existence. Allah knows what's going to happen in the future. And we might be ashamed about certain things in the past. And we're trying to hide them. And what's behind them as well. Allah knows. Allah has much more knowledge of, of all of these subjects. Um, my apologies that I haven't been getting your reflections, but uh, this, will be, uh, this will be the halfway point. Allah knows what's in front of you, what's in the future, and Allah knows what's behind you. Any questions or comments up to this point? I have a question, actually. So I recall hearing in a lecture that prior to the start of the Day of Judgment, there will be two groups of people that will actually go in without reckoning at all. So like the people that were grateful regardless of the situation and people that prayed the hajjud kind of. So would that happen post intercession? Allahu <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I, I'm inclined to say that would actually happen after intercession. And the reason is because the day of judgment would start when this intercession takes place with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Awesome. Thank you. That's kind of what I was thinking. But oh, also, um, I recall hearing that, for example, people that died in Medina or, you know, people that kept extra fasts or people that had good company, people that, you know, prayed no effort and stuff like that, that would also be an intercessor for them. So based on what you just said, this would also happen after they yep. stopped, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, but again, I think the, the, the problem with the after and before scenario is time breaks down <laughs> at this point. Yeah. That, so, that's why I was a bit confused. So that's why, like, I'm saying this out of more out of importance. Um, of this, these narrations seem to be more important or more significant than the other one. So that's why I say this would come before. But I don't necessarily mean that chronologically. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes sense up until you saying not chronologically. <laughs> because time breaks down. All of this is happening at the same. time. Because the I, we experience time as a linear thing because that's our realm of existence right now. Oh, you're saying this may be happening at the same time, essentially? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else, any comments if I didn't confuse you terribly with that last <laughs> comment? I think um, it's kind of interesting that, you know, you said this was the halfway point in the Aya, but it ends with, not ahead of them, but it ends with like behind them, you know? So I wonder like, you know, maybe it's like, you know, the time really doesn't matter to Allah. Maybe that's something that we can get from that. That's true. I'm going to say it's because it's for one more reason, um, but I'll, I'll do that at the end when we look at the ring structure of the surah or of this ayah, um, that this seems to suggest that. Look back and look forward. You're going to see so much order. You're going to see so much knowledge. Mm. Moving on to subject six or statement six of this um, uh, uh, ayah. Um, the best way I could translate is and, and not encompass anything of knowledge except what Allah wills. Um, Ahata is to go around something completely. You know how like when you survey something, you don't look at it from one angle. You look at it from every angle to make sure that you completely understand what the picture is. Uh, most of us don't have ahata. Most of us, like when we think about a situation, what do you see? You see literally from with your own two eyes. And if someone puts something in front of your eyes, you can't see anymore. Like our, our knowledge is super limited because it's such a small frame of reference. And the way to do this is like, they can't ever even comprehend 
the depth of which the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Again, creating that distance of you know things, you do, but don't compare what you know to what Allah knows. And again, this is supposed to be establishing what our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Yes, we talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we even make requests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we we make that with the respect of recognizing like, my knowledge is nothing. Like, I didn't even know what I would do if I understood what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had. Um, We get surprised when even in our own little lives that like um, something seems to make sense. We're like, oh, I get it. I get it. Um, like we get surprised on it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, don't even, you won't even ever fathom what, uh, what the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Um, you can't even kind of just even fully appreciate what that is. Um, and you don't, the other thing is, uh, except for Allah wills for you to know. You can know certain things. Allah's not saying that you're completely ignorant of things. You know things, but only what Allah wants you to know and the extent to which Allah wants you to know. Um, because at the end of the day, your knowledge will be limited by Allah's knowledge. Allah will, uh, uh, by what Allah wants, Allah, your knowledge will be limited by Allah's will. Of You'll only have a capability of consuming certain knowledge and you'll only have a capability of consuming the knowledge that Allah wills for you to, uh, uh, to take on because all of that would also not be good for you. Um, and if we're continuing down, again, who can only make intercession? Who can intercede for you? Someone who knows more. Allah knows what's in front of you and what's behind you. Not only that, but the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't even kind of comprehend where uh, how, how much it is. You can't comprehend uh, the, the uh, extent of it. You, you'll never be able to see the full picture, but you trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the full picture. And moving now towards the end, ayah number seven, or uh, statement number seven. And the kursi, it's typically translated as the uh, throne. Um, arsh is more appropriate for throne. Kursi comes from the root word of karasa or karisa. Um, which is a conjugation of asasa, which is when you put a bunch of uh, things before you build something. It's like the foundation before you build something on top of it, right? And it's this idea of um, uh, the foundation extends across the samawati wal ard. The kursi is apparently sometimes translated as the footstool. Um like Allah's throne is on top of it. This is the footstool that goes on top. I don't like the term footstool because it's too anthropomorphic, but the foundation of it. Uh, if you think the heavens and the earth are vast, the heavens and the earth are almost as if they're the grounding to build this amazing structure, which is what Allah actually has uh, has in store. Um, uh, and that's that's how far it ex- it, it, it extends. Um, and it's just even a, this idea that it uh, wasi eyes of what Allah Subhanahu uses. It's in the past tense that Allah has already established whatever is in the heavens and the earth, and already made and taken ownership and dominion. Um, remember, we said in was kind of alluding to the ring structure already. Number seven, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa talked about uh, uh, Allah said Allah owns what is within the heavens and within the earth. And now, now as Allah is saying, Allah owns the heavens and the earth itself. So not just what's within it, but also it itself. So this would be the idea of dominion. A king typically has dominion, but typically doesn't own everything that's inside. Like if there's a king of a land, people still own their own homes. They own their own property. They own their own clothes. They don't own everything that's inside everything, but the king has dominion. Allah has dominion and owns everything. Um, um, and now moving to the final two statements, uh, um, statement number eight, and protecting them, guarding them doesn't tire Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the slightest, doesn't take away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the slightest. Allah is not only uh, has ownership of it, but Allah also protects it. Again, this is the far away language. In the earlier state, we had the close language, which was what? The one who gave you life, the one who sustains you. Now it's the one who has ownership and dominion over you and the one who protects you. 
So it's both the language as the one who takes care of your smallest needs and the one who takes care of the grandest design is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, found here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this off <laughs> relatively soon and go over the ninth one. Uh, uh, um, and Allah is the most high, the most great. Direct contrast with the first statement that they started off with. Ilaha hayyul qayyum. Your personal Lord, your personal like uh, uh, one who loves you so much and maintains you and gave you life. Aliul Azim. So um, significant, so grand. Muslims do have a approach. Our approach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually, uh, I wouldn't call it contradictory, but it's, it's multifaceted. It's where Allah is close to us, but Allah, we, we never lose respect for who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. We aggrandize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible. Allahu Akbar. Whatever you think Allah is greater. And now I want you to think about how this ayah all comes together. Remember I said that there's nine parts and there's a logical progression of the nine parts. Allah starts off saying, Allahu Hayyul Qayyum. Sustainer, the ever living or the one who provides all life and the one who takes care of all life. Aliul Azim. Great above everything, not like anything. And Azim, super great. Unnecess doesn't need anything. Qayyum makes it sound like they're sustainer. Interacting with you. Azim doesn't need anyone. Neither sleep under uh, neither slumber nor sleep overtakes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where is that found? Um, literally right here. Allah doesn't tire in protection protecting uh, the heavens and the earth. When were the heavens and the earth talked about again? Whatever is within the heavens and whatever is within the earth. Um, then, uh, uh, who is there that's going to have intercession except by uh, 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 the, the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is there that's going to have any knowledge? Because intercession and knowledge are directly related to each other because you need knowledge in order to intercede. And what's what, the one that ties this all together? Allah knows what came before, what comes after, and what comes before. What comes after and what comes before are related to each other. So it's a complete ring structure that the surah comes in. That's one thing that's cool, but I want to think in a little bit even more. This is what really hit me this time when I was reading it. Surah Baqarah has five stories within it, and all of them deal with resurrection. Different forms of resurrection. Some people's hearts are dead and then they come back to life. Adam alayhi salam is literally created. Ibrahim alayhi salam asks about the resurrection. Um, Musa alayhi salam has the story of the person, the people who murdered and the, that person comes back to life. And then their hearts are deadened after that. So much about resurrection. And this ayah actually gets into the idea of resurrection. How will resurrection take place? How are we supposed to appreciate Allah SWT both in this life and in the hereafter? This life, Allah is super close to you. But Allah is also what? The one who wants resurrection takes place is the most high. Recognize that and prepare accordingly. Um, really, really kind of, um, I'm not doing justice to this because it takes like an explanation of the entirety of Surah Baqarah, but uh, it, it hit me like crazy today. Ayat al-Kursi, Surah Baqarah, uh, Ayat al-Kursi is the explanation of every story in Surah al-Baqarah. Like all of it was building up to this thesis of that story was meant to tell you a little bit about Allah, another quality of Allah, another quality of Allah, another quality about Allah. And then suddenly it's hit with this is who Allah is. All of the stories were actually leading up to this for to introduce who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That's the point of almost anything that happens in each of our lives is to introduce who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is. One of these attributes is going to be what, what, what we're supposed to be seeing. Um, any comments or questions? I saw a question in the chat. I'll answer it in a second, inshallah. Can you quickly explain the point you made about um, 
him knowing what's in front of us and behind us and how that relates to the ring structure? Yeah. Um, so on a very basic level, how that's related is what's coming afterward is related to what's came before just now. Even in the aya itself. Does that make sense? And then if we go deeper, how you treated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world determines how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will treat you in the next. And how it's related to the ring structure is Allah knows what came before them and what comes after them. So each of the contents of it, everything past this ends up being in the hereafter. Everything beforehand was in this life. Oh, and the relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for both. We don't rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just for the hereafter. You're not trying to buy your way into Jannah. You're trying to actually develop, a, your actions are to develop a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your fasting isn't just to buy your way into Jannah. That's not it. It's actually to develop a deep sense of appreciation of who Allah is, taqwa in this world. Because that's going to lead to your station in the hereafter. Okay, does, that, does that help? Yes, yes, it does. Yeah. Um, I see a, a really good question. We'll, maybe we'll take one more after this. Uh, how do you differentiate between self-doubt and not knowing? Uh, very, very good question. And I think the answer to that, it's going to sound like a cliche answer, but I promise you it's not. Um, Self-doubt would be that you think you're in control. Not knowing would be knowing that Allah is in control. Um, in terms of if you're unsure about something, there's one thing of getting super worried that like, am I responsible for the end result? There's another of, I need to be doing what I need to do as long as I leave the rest and understand that Allah has a plan and Allah's plan is going to be what comes true. So in reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where the calmness comes from. <laughs> um, I, I just read how Sada responded to the, question, to the question. I think that's actually very well done. Uh, don't doubt, but know for certain that you don't know. <laughs> uh, that's a cynical way of going about it, but that's not bad. Anyone else, any com uh, comments or uh, uh, questions? I was going to say, I think it's interesting because a week or two ago, we were talking about that instinct in our parents where sometimes we should just, just stop questioning and just listen to them because sometimes they just know better. And this is, and in the same way, our parents are given such a high rank in Islam and especially our mother because we were specifically referencing our mothers and um, of all, and when you take that relationship and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love is compared to the love of a mother in the sense where even your own mother won't intercede on your behalf on the day of judgment. Like she won't, everybody's out for themselves on that day, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the comparison between the love of a mother versus the love of Allah, it's like, the only way we can really understand it is by referencing the most important person in our life. But we were talking about how when you get too close to someone, sometimes you lose respect for them. So that's why the respect aspect is so important in Islam because of how close we are to our mother. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, it'll also, yeah. And I, there's a lot that can be said about the quote unquote parenting metaphor, which is a decent one, the closest one oftentimes that we can experience, but even it itself doesn't capture it because your relationship with your mother changes as you grow older because the limitations of the relationship start becoming apparent. Um, uh, it's interesting that apparent is uh, what's, what's, what's found in that, in that statement as well in English. Um, but really, it, that starts becoming really recognized versus your relationship with the lost month that actually, as you grow older, becomes even more and more necessary because the limited nature of you becomes more uh, uh, abundant. Uh, but I think the same concept applies, especially when, when, you're, when you're younger and uh, how to maintain a good, proper working relationship between the two to cause, that be a, to cause development um, requires both closeness and respect. So I think that's, that's a beautiful connection. 
And with that, inshallah, we'll conclude. Um, uh, I'm hoping this made a little bit of sense to you guys. I've just been like, I, I've been reciting Ayat al-Kursi since I was like five or seven years old or something. But literally reading it today, what, I, I felt like I understood things or it, it hit me in a way that I had never appreciated before. And I think that's supposed, and I'm, I'm hoping some of that got uh, um, uh, put through here. We're going to spend two or three more days talking about different ayat that talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and specifically the, our relationship to Allah or how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works because that is, of course, a major theme within the Quran itself. We could argue that is the central theme of the Quran and everything else just explains that. What is prophethood? Your practical way of explaining what, the, what you are supposed to live like. What's the human condition? It was created this way so that you would associate, you would uh, make sure to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is human society's situation? Another one of the ones we're doing. It was supposed to be recognizing the flaws and the strengths that Allah put in you, because what are they at the end of the day? It's to make you long for Allah. And it's to make you appreciate Allah when you see good in society. What's nature? Literally signs that point you towards the order and beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, what is uh, the nature of evil? What happens when you stay away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What path leads you away from that? Uh, what is akhirah? The time when you meet Allah. So do, do you see my point? Like every single one of the major themes we're going to be discussing really does relate to this one. So we'll spend the next three days talking about other ayat about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, as, as we go through them in the Quran. Um, so look forward to inshallah um, going through them with you all. Um, with that, we conclude. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that recite Ayat al Kursi and benefit from its meaning and its many mu'ajizat and uh, many um, uh, narrations about the blessings that are found with it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that appreciate Allah as being the most respectful and the highest um, uh, degree of reverence that we show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we constantly say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater, and we keep. Uh, expanding our conception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also make us amongst those that recognize Allah as our ilah, the object of our love, the one we can go to for our smallest and most I mean, intimate needs, because that's who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, the one who is closer to you than anything, but also the one who's the Lord of the universe, and you are a tiny speck of dust. It's in that balance that we get to actually appreciate our humility, but also in our humility, recognize how beloved we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that get the intercession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khayrin wal asr inna l-insana lafi khusar illa al-lazina aminu wa aminu salihat atwasa bin hafti dhu wa sallu sabr. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.